for our lives as it's been billed. This is the final push for members of this crowd now making their way so they can see the stage from any number of different vantage points in the capital city. We have been blessed here with very good weather for this many people visiting Washington. As you've perhaps heard, if you've been following our coverage thus far today, there are 800 separate uh, so-called sister events going on on every continent except for Antarctica today. And uh, we'll be concentrating, of course, mostly uh, here in Washington. Again, about five minutes from now, our attention will go down to the stage uh, where the events will be underway. And we're going to try to bring you uh, as many of the speakers as possible, as many of the entertainers as possible. Uh, uh, Mariana Tencio is down in the crowd, I am told, and we can go to her for some of what we're experiencing behind us. Ryan, you can see what is behind me. It is hordes of people just descending upon the nation's capital. Hundreds of thousands of folks, an estimated half a million young people for what seems like a moment in a generation, Brian. It is energetic, it is busy, and it is historic. We have been talking to folks who have come from all over the country, from Ohio, from Minnesota. I personally drove in with students from Kentucky, young people who we have talked to today as young as six years old, some who are already 18 who will be voting this year, putting aside their weekend plans to be here to raise their voices for this issue they feel so passionately about. Let's talk to this family. You guys all came together, and I understand there's a significance with the Columbine shooting in your family that made you be here today. I, I didn't hear what you said. I'm sorry. <laughs> Columbine really impacted your family. It That's did. Why it did. I was actually in the hospital giving birth to my daughter here when I was watching that unfold on TV, and I thought, what kind of world am I bringing these children into? And that's not the kind of world that I want for my kids. So, Brian, young people uh, like her, her mother just referenced, being born on a day like, like Columbine and seeing school shootings become normalized. Tell me what kind of change you want to see in Washington. Um, I, we need more stricter gun, con, uh, stricter gun laws. <laughs> um, and you're sorry, 18. I'm... You're 18 years old. No, don't worry. I know it's a, it's but an I'm important not. moment, yeah. and we're on with Brian Williams. You're 18 years old. Are you going to take this power that that you're seeing and you're channeling in the streets now to the polls this year? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Ryan, as I told you, it's a whole family here. You're the, the younger sister. You're 14 years old. Tell me what has inspired you from the Parkland students. Okay, so I'm a journalism student at my school, and I've been, it's like my job for our paper. And I go through and I read all the stuff so I can get, so we can make sure we have our information correct. And I, just reading it, it was just really hard because it was just so sad. And um, earlier in the school year, someone had threatened to bring a gun to school, and um, he ended up getting expelled from the district because, like, it was, he was planning on doing it. And it was his friends who had seen what he was doing who told everyone to not come to school and things like that. It just, like, if only they had had seen that things like that were going to happen. Thank you so much for, for telling that to us. Brian, it's these kids seeing what happened in Parkland and thinking this could happen to me, as you just heard, any day. That's why they're here. That's why they feel so passionate about this issue. Let's see if we can talk to some more folks over here. And I just want to give you a view over here of this, the, the other side. There's a bottleneck now because people are just anxious to see the performers, to see those speakers that we're going to be bringing you live on MSNBC. And let's talk to this young group here. Hi, guys. How are you? Good. We're live on MSNBC with Brian Williams. Wow. Just real quickly, where are you guys from? Uh, New Carrollton, Hartford High School. Yeah, Maryland. Maryland, Maryland. 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 Well, thank you so much. They're out here. Uh, you know, again, Brian, it, it's what. I think we've lost, we've lost Mariana briefly, and that's going to happen today. Uh, adding to the thrill of this live broadcast. We can't see what's on television because of the angle of the sun coming in here. So we're flying uh, as blind as the folks uh, watching at, at home. I am told we have two different cities up on the screen right now. 
Perhaps you've seen the pictures out of Boston, out of Dallas, out of St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, Carrie Sanders is out in the crowd for us right now. Carrie? Hey, for now, they're telling me. We've lost Carrie Sanders. All right, well, the Jacob Soboroff is out in the crowd for us, Jacob. Brian, I don't know if you can see me or hear me. Part of the reason that that is the case <laughs> is that we operate off of these units called Live View Technology. It's based on cell signals. And my hunch is there are so many young people out here flooding social media. Part of the reason this movement has been so powerful and has been powered by, um, that's why we're taking hits on cell signals all across our broadcast and probably broadcast across the television spectrum today. These are some of the people uh, that are here using social media to get the message out. This is a group of students from Fairfax, Virginia. What's your name? Why'd you come out? Daisy. Daisy. And wh why are you here today? To protect our rights and the fact that we shouldn't have to be afraid to go to school every day. Just, and are you afraid to go to school yeah. every day? Because you never know what's going to happen. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, this is uh, your fellow student. What's your name? Savannah. Savannah, uh, what compelled you to come out? You guys come out here together as students? Do you have a chaperone or what? No, we just came out here, yeah. By yourself? Mm -hmm. You feel uh, excited, nervous? What's it like to be surrounded by hundreds of thousands of people? Um, it's a little bit of both. It's really exciting. Exciting though to have this opportunity yeah, to have a lot of people come together to I show have, have a lot of people come together you just said. for one cause yeah uh, Brian I got to uh, tell you where we are I think we're probably about nine blocks away from the Capitol this is the Trump uh, if we can swing this way the Trump International Hotel where we know the president likes to uh, frequent for some time away uh, from the White House here's some uh, some other folks here what's your name bud Malachi Malachi what brought you out here to march today um to put gun uh, gun but gun violence, right? Yeah. Gun restrictions, you said. Uh, are you scared to go to school uh, about the idea that guns might come into your school, bud? A little, yeah. And, and so yeah. when you saw what happened in Florida, um, these 17 young people lost their lives. What did you think? I thought it was a terrible thing and it should never happen again. Never again. And never, thank you so much, Malachi. It's nice to meet you. Never again is one of the refrains, of course, Brian, that we're hearing out here. Let's swing back around uh, this way, away from where the march is actually happening. And you can see, Brian, as far as the eye can see, um, human beings. It's, we were out here for the inauguration, the Women's March. It's, uh, this is nothing like I've ever seen before. It's completely different. Young people powered, right? Yeah, this is um, kind of unfolding as we watch. We have, uh, uh, until the end of the day, we really won't have any good idea on crowd size. And even then, uh, it will just be uh, estimates. Uh, to our control room, tell me where you would like us to go next. Tammy Leitner is down in the crowd. And again, to our viewers, try to roll with us because a lot of the communications are getting crowded out today. There's only so much bandwidth, a lot of networks trying to cover this event. Everyone's phone is in use, but thankfully, Tammy Leitner standing by to talk to us. Tammy. Hey, Brian, I am out here with uh, Daniel Williams, and Daniel's a senior. I spoke with Daniel just days after the shooting happened. Um, it was a tough time. You were still trying to process things, and it's only been a month. Tell me how you're doing today. Well, I, I'm a little bit uh, more used to the fact that it happened. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing better than I was. Um, uh, the shock hit me. I realized this happened, you know. I went through like a period of, am I okay? I, I wasn't really okay for a period of time, but now I'm out here to make a difference. I'm out here to fight back and make sure this doesn't happen to anyone else. And what does it mean to you? I mean, seeing a half a million people out here today because of you and your fellow students at your school. It's amazing to see the support we're getting. Um, and this is not it. There's half a million people. There's thousands, probably millions of more around the world. There's like 800 marches around the world, I heard. It's just, it's it's heartwarming. It's, it's great that we were seeing this amount of support, and it's great. Yeah. And it sounds like they are getting ready to uh, to start right behind us, Brian. I don't know if you can hear that. It sounds like they're taking the stage, uh, so I'm going to toss it back to you. Tammy, thank you. We can hear that, and it sounds like we're underway. Let's uh, dip in and hear the greeting from the stage. What's happening, you can hear the PA system up and down the mall here. Yes, sir. We had a girl pass out down there. Of course. 
I'll tell you who is here with us. That's the Reverend Al Sharpton. Reverend, um, we've had large gatherings in Washington. Uh, it is very clear that by the close of business today, when the sun goes down, we won't ever have seen anything exactly like this. Absolutely. You know, Brian, I've been to a lot of large gatherings, rallies, marches, some I call, but none have we seen this dominated, called, and orchestrated by young people. Uh, I think they'll exceed the 500,000, but whatever the number, the makeup and the content of it is something that this nation has never seen. This is an awe-inspiring moment. The motto seems to be, lead, follow, or get out of the way. And I think they've made that message clear. I think that they will impact where we are in American history in terms of a midterm election. I think we're seeing a real movement here, not just a moment, but a real movement. And you're fine with the fact that they are saying, in effect, to all the adults in their way, you have failed us on this issue. I think they are not only uh, am I fine with it, they're right. Which is why when they invited me to come but said nobody's speaking over 18 years old, I said I want to be there to encourage them because they are making the difference. The, the real uh, aim must be to deal with the issue of guns, not to deal with who got it done. Let's listen in a bit. They've just counted down to start the performances. We're going to continue to uh, spool around and show you New York City, Boston, St. Paul, Washington, D.C. The biggest crowd is right here behind us. Let's listen in.
God bless y'all. Okay, for rise up to We're talking to Reverend Al Sharpton. It's a heck of a way to get things started. Very, very good opening and appropriate song, and, and I think it captures the spirit of this crowd, Brian. Speaking of trying to capture this day, we're going to be revolving in all these live pictures, 800 concurrent events, aside from the large event here in Washington. Absolutely, all over the world, I might add. And I think that is why, particularly in a midterm election, yeah, this can't be ignored. Because if you're running for office, if you are seeking votes, you're looking at people and their parents in multiple cities in enormous numbers saying, we're concerned about this. This can't be spinned by any political consultants. What do you think it's like to see this from NRA headquarters? It's got to be very, very concerning to them because now you have bodies, now you have people that are across economic and partisan lines saying something must be done. I think the inclusiveness, I think the interconnectedness, connectiveness is something that we've not seen on this issue. Many of us have been on this issue a long time. We've never been able to expand it here. NRA must be very concerned. Uh, let's take a look at what's happening on stage here in Washington. We're also going to be seeing uh, videos from time to time that we can uh, plug into here, share the experience that people are watching here in Washington, D.C. Reverend, this is a live picture. We can't quite see it from Atlanta. John Lewis walking uh, behind the banner with protesters. Um, a position he is used to being in. It. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And it, it must be amazing to John Lewis to be marching with these youngsters. And he was marching since he was a youngster. And to have him out front in Atlanta is, is, is something I think that is historic. He's got many years left in his career and many years of activism left, let's hope. But here he is again today. Absolutely. And, 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 a, and on an issue that he's been on, he did the sit-in just two years ago on the floor in the Congress around this same issue. To see this kind of widespread uh, support around this issue must mean a lot to John Lewis. We have a wealth of material coming into us. All these live cameras, many of the cities where we have uh, NBC television stations, no crowd larger than it is here in Washington. Uh, several different vantage points on this crowd. People are still pressing down from all the tributaries, side streets, plazas, public parks, so they can get some view of the stage, some view of the large flat screen TVs. I can tell you from personal experience, the sound system is very effective. You can hear it for blocks throughout uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, Tammy Leitner is in the crowd for us. Tammy, you have one of the VIP guests here today. 
I do, Brian. I'm here with Senator Tammy Duckworth. Uh, Senator, tell me, tell me what today means to you. You, uh, you actually fought uh, in the military, but you're in favor of gun control. So talk to me a little bit about today and why you decided to be out here. Well, I'm out here for my daughter's life and my soon-to-be-born daughter's lives. I, I, she just started preschool, and I can't imagine sending her off to school and her not coming back. We need sensible gun legislation, and uh, those who have been trained in firearms know that you need universal background checks, that AR-15s don't belong in our streets, and we can do better, and these kids are holding us accountable. And, Senator, what is it going to take to get something passed? Well, the, the legislation is written. I'm co-sponsoring quite a few of them. Just put it on the floor for a vote. I asked Speaker Ryan, I asked Mitch McConnell, please put it on the floor for a vote. This will pass. And are you surprised to see these kids being so vocal and getting something done? I'm surprised, but I'm also so proud of them. They're exercising their democracy, and I, I just, I'm so proud of them and what they've managed to do here, and it's all across the country. It takes kids to get something done these days, huh? Well, certainly we're not getting anything done in Congress, so I'm glad the kids are the impetus, but just let us have a vote, because the bills are written, they can pass, uh, but, but we just need to be allowed to vote on them. Senator, thank you for being with us. Thank I appreciate you. it. Looks like you have I your hands know. full here. <laughs> Brian, I'm going to toss it back to you. All right, Tammy, thank you. Let's go up to the stage. To the leaders, skeptics, and cynics who told us to sit down and say, stay silent, wait your turn. Welcome to the revolution. It is a powerful and peaceful one because it is of, by, and for the young people of this country. My name is Cameron Kasky. Since this movement began, people have asked me, do you think any change is gonna come from this? Look around, we are the change. Everybody here is standing with the future of our society, and for that, I thank you. My generation, having spent our entire lives seeing mass shooting after mass shooting, has learned that our voices are powerful and our votes matter. We must educate ourselves and start conversations that keep our country moving forward, and we will. We hereby promise to fix the broken system we've been forced into and create a better world for the generations to come. Don't worry, we've got this. The people of this country now see past the lies. We've seen this narrative before. For the first time, the corrupt aren't controlling our story. We are. The corrupt aren't manipulating the facts. We know the truth. Shooting after shooting, the American people now see one thing they all have in common, the weapons. Politicians either represent the people or get out. The people demand a law banning the sale of assault weapons. The people demand we prohibit the sale of high capacity magazines. The people demand universal background checks. Stand for us or beware, the voters are coming. On February 14th, tragedy struck my hometown and my school, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High. Alyssa Alhadef, Scott Beagle, Martin Duque Anguiano, Aaron Feiss, Jamie Guttenberg, Chris Hickson, Luke Hoyer, Kara Lochran, Gina Montalto, Joaquin Oliver, Elena Petty, Meadow Pollock, Helena Ramsey, Alex Schachter, Carmen Shantrup, Peter Wang, and Nicholas Dwarad all lost their lives in less than seven minutes. And I saved Nicholas for the end because today is Nicholas's birthday. Nicholas, we are all here for you. Happy birthday. Their families endured great pain. Many others were injured, and thousands of young people, my classmates, were forced to become adults and were targeted as adults. We have to do this for them. We must stand beside those we've lost and fix the world that betrayed them. This doesn't just happen in schools. Americans are being attacked in churches, nightclubs, movie theaters, and on the streets. But we, the people, can fix this. For the first time in a long while, I look forward 10 years and I feel hope. I see light. I see a system I'll be proud of. But it all starts with you. The march is not the climax of this movement, it is the beginning. It is the springboard off of which my generation and all who stand with us will jump into a safer future. Today is a bad day for tyranny and corruption. 
Today, we take to the streets in over 800 marches around the globe and demand common sense gun laws. Today is the beginning of a bright new future for this country. And if you think today is good, just wait for tomorrow. We must protect, educate, and inspire the future. And everybody here is proof that we will do that and the future is looking very bright for this country. Thank you. For the chant. Everybody repeat after me. Everyday shootings, everyday shootings. Everyday are everyday problems. Everyday problems. Oh, that was a little weak, everybody. I need, I need stronger than that. Everyday shootings, everyday shootings. are everyday problems. Everyday problems. Now, make sure everybody watch to hear us. Everyday shootings, everyday shootings. are everyday problems. My name is Trevon Bosley, and I'm here with the brave youth leaders of St. Sabina. And I'm here to speak on behalf of Chicago's youth who are surrounded and affected by gun violence every day. I'm here to speak for those youth who fear they may be shot while going to the gas station, the movies, the bus stop, to church, or even to and from school. I'm here to speak for those Chicago youth who feel their voices have been silenced for far too long. And I'm here to speak on behalf of everyone that believes a child getting shot and killed in Chicago or any other city is still a not acceptable norm. Most importantly, I'm here to speak on behalf of my brother Terrell Bosley, who was shot and killed while leaving church April 4, 2006. Just to give you guys a few stats from Chicago, since 2006, there have been more than 5,850 people shot and killed in Chicago. And since 2012, there have been more than 16,000 people shot. Now, let me repeat that one more time. Since 2006, there have been more than 5,850 people shot and killed in Chicago. And since 2012, there have been more than 16,000 people shot in Chicago. These stats are not just numbers in the speech. These are mothers, fathers, sons, and daughters on a societal proportion. These are lawyers, doctors, artists, musicians. And more than anything else, these are lives cut short due to senseless gun violence. I must add, though, Chicago's violence epidemic didn't start overnight. It was caused by many problems that we are still not de dealing with to this day. When you have a city that feels it's more important to help pay for a college and sports complex rather than fund uh, schools and impoverished communities, you have gun violence. When you have a city, when you have a city that feels we need more divvy bikes in downtown Chicago for tourists rather than more funding for workforce programs to get guys off the streets real jobs, you have gun violence. We have an Illinois state governor, Bruce Rauner, who feels that funding anti-violence programs is, I quote, non-essential spending, you have gun violence. When you have elected officials who feel that getting a few extra dollars from the NRA is more important than their actual constituents, you have gun violence. And when you have a president that would rather constantly talk about and belittle Chicago's violence than rather than send funds and resources, you have gun violence. It's time for the nation to realize gun violence is more than just a Chicago problem or a Parkland problem, but it's an American problem. We are here demanding that this country, that we get the... We are here demanding that we get what we as these people of this country deserve. We deserve a right to have a life of fear without fear of being gunned down. We can only live in this so often called the American dream if we have the proper gun legislation and resources to do so. And in Chicago's case, no more frivolous spending on tourist attractions, but rather we need to spend on the people that actually live there. It's time to care about all communities equally. It's time to stop judging some communities as worthy and some communities as unworthy. It's time to stop judging youth that look like me or my brother and that come from impoverished communities any different than anyone else. It's time for America to notice that everyday shootings are everyday problems. I'll close with this quote by Martin Luther King Jr. which said, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. I said this to say, no matter the hurdles we may face along this journey, we must remain hopeful and we must continue to stand together and fight for the lives that we deserve. Thank you.
everyone. Um, oh, my speech. We're good. Okay. Okay. My name is Delaney Tarr, and I'm here today because I am a Marjorie Stoneman Douglas student. However, I am not here today for the media. I'm not here for the crowds, as great as you all are, for the fame, or for the fun. I'm here on this stage today, and I'm here working every day for my 17 fellow Eagles pronounced dead because of gunfire. I am here for every person that has died at the hands of gun violence, and for the many more whose lives were irreparably changed because of it. I think, I hope, that that is why we are all here, because this is more than just a march. This is more than just one day, one event, then moving on. This is not a mere publicity stunt, a single day in the span of history. This is a movement. This is a movement relying on the persistence and the passion of its people. We cannot move on. If we move on, the NRA and those against us will win. They want us to forget. They want our voices to be silenced, and they want to retreat into the shadows where they can remain unnoticed. They want to be back on top unquestioned in their corruption. But we cannot and we will not let that happen. Today and every day, we will continue to fight for those things that are right. We will continue to fight for common sense. We will continue to fight for our lives. We will continue to fight for our dead friends. There will be no faltering, no pauses in our cause. Every moment will be dedicated to those pieces of legislation. Every march, every meeting, every moment. All for that assault weapons ban to keep these weapons of war out of the hands of civilians who do not need them. All for the prohibition of high capacity magazines because no hunter will ever need access to a magazine that can kill 17 in mere minutes. for the reinforcement of background checks and closing of loopholes because there must be more requirement for a person to access a gun than just a wad of cash. There are so very many things, so many steps to take. Like right now, sign our petition. It takes two seconds and it matters. We will take the big and we will take the small, but we will keep fighting. When they give us that inch, that bump stock ban, we will take a mile. We are not here for breadcrumbs, we are here for real change. We are here to lead. We are here to call out every single politician, to force them into enacting this legislation, to addressing this legislation, to doing more than a simple band-aid on a broken bone. The pressure is on for every person in power, and it will stay that way. Because they know what is coming. They know that if there is no assault weapons ban passed, then we will vote them out. They know that if there is no tightening of the background checks, we will vote them out. They know that if there is no shrinking of magazine capacity, then we will vote them out. If they continue to ignore us, to only pretend to listen, then we will take action where it counts. We will take action every day in every way until they simply cannot ignore us anymore. Today, we march, we fight, we roar. We prepare our signs, we raise them high. We know what we want, we know how to get it, and we are not waiting any longer. Thank you. Carrie Sanders is down in it, Carrie. Well, that was Delaney Tarr. Uh, she's a senior at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, 17 years old, incredibly poised. She, along with 17 other students in her class the day of the shooting, went into hiding, unsure what was going on on campus. You heard her very well-delivered speech. She is well-known at her school because in part of being one of the student journalists, she's also the anchor on the in-house school television system. So very well spoken. The first person that we heard 
from there. That was uh, Cameron Kasky. He's an actor at the school, somebody who was involved in debate, somebody who has found himself thrust into this position where he is speaking along with others for their generation, something known as Generation X. When the shooting happened on campus, Cameron was concerned about his younger brother, Holden. His younger brother, Holden, has autism, and he was able to make his way to the classroom where Holden was along with other students, and Cameron went in there with a bunch of confused students who have autism and other emotional problems, and he was able to calm them down as he hugged his brother and others and was on the floor. And then finally, between the two speakers, we heard that very powerful speech from Chicago. I met a young, another young man who's traveled here with that young man. His name is Keyshawn Newman. Keyshawn Newman lost his brother to violence, gun violence in Chicago. He carries around on his phone something that I got to say I did not know existed, but he has an app on his phone, and that app updates every four hours, and it gives the tally of gun victims in his community so that he can see what the numbers are, 110 for the month of March. And when you consider that a student, after losing a brother, is looking at the possibility of the statistics, you realize how dire this is. Brian? that the world of electronics and computers has to invent a workaround uh, for something as heinous as that. Um, Demi Lovato has just started uh, performing. Let's sample some of that.
strong. Thank you. Jacob Soboroff is standing by in the crowd after uh, Demi Lovato's voice was heard throughout every nook and cranny of this city. Jacob? Brian, seven tenths of a mile away from that stage. We're here at 12th in Pennsylvania. It's supposed to be the end of the march. Really, it seems like this is just where the march is beginning. I ran into and I met Jocelyn Garcia. She's the president of the United States Student Association. It is the oldest uh, and biggest student association in this country. So big, so old, such a legacy that they worked with Dr. King uh, to organize sit ins at lunch counters. Jocelyn, uh, I say this to you respectfully. I met you out here. You don't have much of an entourage. You didn't really have to do much for all these students to show up here today. Well, not me personally, and that's because, you know, students are beginning to understand their rights. They understand that there is power in numbers, that the students are not just naive people who don't understand how things work. Students have power, and they came here because they wanted to demonstrate their power, and they knew that with the masses, they'll be able to create policy and change and not just have to sit with prayers and thoughts. I have to ask you, where does gun control, gun reform, fall into the list of things that you think should be important to students? You know, you've spent most of your time focusing on tuition. You work on DACA. Where does gun control play into all of this? Well, at USSA, we believe in education justice, meaning that anyone, no matter what your identity is and what your background is, should have the right to an education. You being able to feel safe on your campus is a part of that education justice. You being able to prosper in your life after your education, you know, involves you actually being able to be alive. Cameron Caskey mentioned it up on the stage that these young people are going to get out there and vote. It's no secret to you yeah. that millennials now have surpassed baby boomers as the largest potential voting bloc in this country. Absolutely. Do you think it will go from people marching on the streets to marching into the voting booths? Oh, absolutely. And I know that USSA and many of our partner organizations are going to ensure that that is possible. And another thing is that there are a lot of barriers that prevent students and other communities from voting. What organizations are going to be doing is ensuring that people have access to be able to cast their vote because people want to. It's about like the accessibility to be able to do so. And just real quick before we go, what is it like to be out here? This is unbelievable. It, it's amazing. Um, you know, I'm out here and I'm processing everything. Let me hold, let me hold you here. Brian, I'm going to send it back to you so we can go back up to the stage. We just, we don't want to cut off any voices in the crowd except for those voices on the stage. So we'll go back up to the event. It comes out to a dollar and five cents. Is that all we're worth to these politicians? A dollar and five cents? Was $17 and 85 cents all it cost you that day, Mr. Rubio? Well, I say one life is worth more than all the guns in America. This is not a red versus blue issue. This is a morals issue. And to the politicians that believe that their right to own a gun comes before our lives, get ready to get voted out by us, the future. We will not allow a price to be put upon our lives. We will no longer be hunted down and treated like prey by politicians who simply just don't care about us. We are fighting. We have been fighting. We've been fighting since Columbine, since Sandy Hook, since Pulse, since, since Las Vegas. And we will continue to fight until we put a stop to gun violence in America. Because we are no longer a statistic in this country. We will not be treated like a statistic in this country. My school, Pulse, every other mass shooting will no longer be a statistic because we're going to put an end to those statistics and we will never stop fighting. Thank you.
buenas tardes. My name is Edna Lisbeth Chavez, and I am from South Los Angeles, California, el sur de Los Angeles. I am a 17-year-old senior at Manual Arts High School and a member of an organization called Community Coalition, where I am a youth leader at South Central Youth Empowered Through Action. At Community Coalition, we organize high school students to develop their leadership skills in order to push for educational justice in our communities. That's why I got involved. I wanted to impact policies and make sure our voices are heard. I am a youth leader. I am a survivor. I have lived in South LA my entire life and have lost many loved ones to gun violence. This is normal. Normal to the point that I've learned to duck from bullets before I learned how to read. My brother, he was in high school when he passed away. It was a day like any other day, sunset going down on South Central. You hear pops thinking they're fireworks. They weren't pops. You see the melanin on your brother's skin turn gray. Ricardo was his name. Can y'all say it with me? If the bullet did not kill me, that anxiety and that trauma will. I carry that trauma everywhere I go. I carry it with me in schools, in class, walking home and visiting loved ones. And I am not alone in this experience. For decades, my community of South Los Angeles has become accustomed to this violence. It is normal to see candles. It is normal to see posters. It is normal to see balloons. It is normal to see flowers honoring the lives of black and brown youth that have lost their lives to a bullet. How can we cope with it when our school district has its own police department? Instead of making black and brown students feel safe, they continue to profile and criminalize us. Instead, we should have a department specializing in restorative justice. We need to tackle the root causes of the issues we face and come to an understanding on how to resolve them. I am here to honor the Florida students that lost their lives and to stand with the Parkland students. I am here today to honor Ricardo. I am here today to honor Stephen Clark. I am here today to uplift my South LA community! <laughs> enough is enough. Quite 
question. How many more Trojans have to die so that this problem is finally acknowledged? Policymakers, listen up. Army teachers will not work. More security in our schools does not work. Zero tolerance policies do not work. They make us feel like criminals. We should feel empowered and supported in our schools. Instead of funding these policies, fund mentorship programs, mental health resources, paid internship and job opportunities. My brother, like many others, would have benefited from this. So let's make it happen. It's important to work with people that are impacted by these issues, the people you represent. We need to focus on changing the conditions that foster violence and trauma. And that's how we will transform our communities and uplift our voices. This has not and shall not stop us. It has only empowered us. Mi nombre, my name, is Edna Lisbeth Chavez. Remember my name? Remember these faces. Remember us and how we're making a change. La lucha sigue. Gracias y bendiciones. My name is Alex Wynn. I'm a junior at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. In the wake of the tragedy on February 14th, we, as students, as youths, decided that if adults weren't going to take action, we would. No gun-related legislation has been passed in this country since 2008. 10 years ago. Since 2008, there have been at least 95 mass shootings in this country and hundreds and thousands more just senseless violence on the cities of our nation in cities like Miami, Chicago, and Baltimore. It needs to stop. People believe that the youth of this country are insignificant. People believe that the youths have no voice. When Joan of Arc fought back English forces, she was 17 years old. When Mozart wrote his first symphony, he was eight years old. To those people that tell us that teenagers can't do anything, I say that we were the only people that could have made this movement possible. Together, we will use our voices to make sure that our schools, churches, movie theaters, and concerts, and our streets become safer without having them feel like prisons. If teachers start packing heat, are they gonna arm our pastors, ministers, and rabbis? Are they gonna arm the guy scanning tickets at the movie theater? Are they gonna arm the person wearing the Mickey Mouse costume at Disney? This is what the National Rifle Association wants, and we will not stand for it. We would not need metal detectors and clear backpacks and more weapons in our streets if there weren't weapons of war in the hands of civilians. 
For too long, our government has been useless on this, just on this issue. Our job as their constituents is to make sure we know what they're thinking. There are over 250 representatives that have not come out with a public stance on this issue. It is our job to make sure that we call them up and force them out of the shadows of corruption and into the light of justice. As teens, people think that we don't like to wait around for things, and they're sometimes right. <laughs> a lot of you are probably wondering, what now? Now, we need to come together on all fronts and push aside those that divide us. Now we need to get on the phone and call our representatives and push them to stop incumbency and take action. Now we need to educate ourselves on which politicians are truly working for the people and which ones we want to vote out. Because at the end of the day, bullets do not discriminate. So why should we? It is not about your race. It is not about your sexual orientation. It is not about your ethnicity. It is not about your gender. It is not about where you live or how much money you make. And it most certainly is not about political party. All it comes down to is life or death. To all the politicians out there, if you take money from the NRA, you have chosen death. If you have not expressed to your constituents a public stance on this issue, you have chosen death. If you do not stand with us by saying we need to pass common sense gun legislation, you have chosen death. And none of the millions of people marching in this country today will stop until they see those against us out of office. Because we choose life! Thank you, I love you all! To our viewers, um, and just a note, they're pausing here to play some uh, videos, and when they do, um, we're talking to our friends here with us in Washington, Reverend Al Sharpton, and we've now been joined by Chris Matthews here on stage. Chris, I heard you on your broadcast say last night that you've always urged people to come to this city to yeah. see what their tax dollars have. Yeah purchased, but today takes on even more importance. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, I always say to working families and middle class families, come to Washington on vacation because you already paid for it. All these museums, all these monuments, it's a pretty inexpensive tri family trip and it's a great way to learn about your country. But you also have a right under the Constitution to petition, to, to go to Congress and make your case. What I love about this today, I, the, my last big rally, by the way, Brian, it was 1967, the March on the Pentagon, 51 years ago. It's pretty scary. And, and that's the kind of a rally where it was anti-war, but everybody jumped onto it and everybody you know, used it. Everybody had their kiosks and their, uh, what do you call them, their card tables with their pitches. This is really focused on guns. It's very pure. There's some, uh, there's some philosophy here, but it's really not an exploitative. It's really, uh, these kids are concerned about safety and guns, and it's really a, a very pure, I think a demonstration of, of numbers, and I also think we may get a million people here today. I have never seen crowds pouring away from Union Station like I saw an hour ago. It's incredible, the sea of people. Um, Al Sharpton, I'm told uh, the next performance is uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda of uh, Hamilton fame. Oh yeah. A, a New Yorker here in Washington. Let's listen in. The story of tonight. Don't tell the story of tonight. tonight. Have you ever felt like nobody was there? Have you ever felt forgotten in the middle of nowhere? Have you ever felt like you could disappear? You could fall, and no one would hear. Well, let that lonely feeling wash away. All we see is lies. Maybe there's a reason to believe you'll be okay. Because when you don't feel strong enough to stand, you can reach, reach out your hand. 
Thank you. Enough is enough. Just joining us, we're showing you, as we show you scenes from around the country, if you're just joining us, we're waiting for the next speaker to get to the podium. We're trying to televise all the remarks from the stage here in Washington. I'm here to represent the hundreds and the hundreds of thousands of students who live in everyday, who live every day in constant paranoia and fear on their way to and from school. At this moment, please raise your hand if you have been affected by gun violence to honor the ones you have lost. Today, I raise, I raise my hand in honor of my twin brother, Zaire Kelly. <laughs> Zaire was shot on September 20th, 2017, on his way home from a competitive college counseling after school program called College Bound. Zaire had the personality that would light up the room. He was energetic and full of dreams and aspirations. He was our team captain on a track team. He was running for student government president, and he was a youth council member. He aspired to be a forensic scientist and attend Florida a and University for undergrad. <laughs> Zaire was also the best dresser I knew with the most style. He was a person, a leader, an aspirer, not just another statistic. I was in contact with Zaire while he was walking home, texting him and calling him all through the night. About 20 to 30 minutes went by, and I became worried because the walk alone doesn't even take 30 minutes. I left my room to ask my mom where he was until I saw flashing blue and red lights outside my window. I told my parents that there were police cars and an ambulance on our street. We rushed outside, discovering that it was Zaire. That night, on September 20th, 
a robber with a gun, was lurking on my streets for hours. On my way, on my walk home, he attempted to rob me, but I ran. Though he had an ankle monitor on, and he was supposed to be monitored by the police, he was still able to obtain a gun illegally, and lurk in my streets, and take my brother's life. He shot my brother in the head. I want, it will be a... Once we arrived to the hospital, he was pronounced dead. From the time we were born, we shared everything, including issues. I spent time with him every day because we went to the same school, shared the same friends, and we even shared the same room. Can you imagine how it would be to lose someone that close to you? Sadly, too many of my friends and peers can. This school year alone, my school lost two students to senseless gun violence. Paris Brown and my brother Zaire Kelly. This year alone, in January, there were six students killed under the age of 19 by guns here in Washington, D.C. In my brother's name, my family is proposing the Zaire Kelly Public Safety Zone Amendments Act of 2018. This act aims to create safe passage zones for students to and from schools and other activities by expanding the definition of a student. With this amendment, a student would be, a student would be defined by any person enrolled in a public and private daycare center, elementary school, vocational school, secondary school, excuse me. A college, junior college or university. It expands gun-free zones to include recreation centers. This amendment means that every student in Washington, D.C. will carry the protection of my brother's name ensuring safety as they travel to and from school in our city. My name is Zion Kelly, and just like all of you, I've, I have had enough. First off, I'm going to start off by putting this price tag right here as a reminder for you guys to know how much Marco Rubio took for every student's life in Florida. One dollar and five cents. Okay. The cold grasp of corruption shackles the District of Columbia. The winter is over. Change is here. The sun shines on a new day and the day is ours. For the fir first time voters show up 18% of the time at midterm elections, not anymore. Now, who here is gonna vote in the 2018 election? If you listen real close, you can hear the people in power shaking. They've gotten used to being protective of their position, chewing safety the safety of inaction. Inaction is no longer safe, and to that we say, no more. 96 people, 96 people die every day from guns in our country, yet most representatives have no public stance on guns. And to that, we say, no more. We are going to make this the voting issue. We're going to make, take this to every election, to every state, and every city. We're going to make sure the best people get in our elections to run, not as politicians, but as Americans. Because this, this is not cutting it. When people try to suppress your vote, and there are people who stand against you because you are too young, we say no more. 
When politicians say that your voice doesn't matter because the NRA owns them, we say no more. When politicians send their thoughts and prayers with no action, we say no more. And to those politicians supported by the NRA that allow the continued slaughter of our children and our future, I say get your resumes ready. Today is the beginning of spring, and tomorrow is the beginning of democracy. Now is the time to come together, not as Democrats, not as Republicans, but as Americans. Americans of the same flesh and blood that care about one thing and one thing only, and that's the future of this country and the children that are going to lead it. Now, they will try to separate us in demographics. They will try to separate us by religion, race, congressional district, and class. They will fail. We will come together. We will get rid of these public servants that only serve the gun lobby. And we will save lives. You are those heroes. <laughs> Lastly, let's put the USA over the NRA. This is the start of the spring and the blossoming of our democracy. So let's take this to our local legislators and let's take this to midterm elections because without the persistent heat, without the persistence of voters and Americans everywhere getting out to every election, democracy will not flourish, but it can and it will. So I say to those politicians that say change will not come, I say we will not stop until every man, every woman, every child, and every American can live without fear of gun violence. And to that I say, no more. Thank you. I love you all. God bless all of you, and God bless America. We can and we will change the world. <laughs> Me and my friend Carter led a walk out at our elementary school on the 14th. We walked out, we walked out for 18 minutes, adding a minute to honor Cortland Arrington, an African American girl who was the victim of gun violence in her school in Alabama after the Parkland shooting. I am here today to represent Cortland Arrington. I am here today to represent Hadia Pendleton. I, I am here today to represent Tiana Thompson, who at just 16 was shot dead in her home here in Washington, D.C. I am here today to acknowledge and represent the African American girls whose stories don't make the front page of every national newspaper. whose stories don't lead on the evening news. I represent the African American women who are victims of gun violence, who are simply statistics instead of vibrant, beautiful girls at full of potential. It is my privilege to be here today. I am indeed full of privilege. My voice has been heard. I am here to acknowledge their stories, to say they matter, to say their names, because I can, and I was asked to be. For far too long, these names, these black girls and women, have been just numbers. I am here to say, never again for those girls, too. I am here to say that everyone should value those girls, too. People have said that I am too young to have these thoughts on my own. People
people have said that I am a tool of some nameless adult. It's not true. My friends and I might still be 11, and we might still be in elementary school, but we know. We know life isn't equal for everyone, and we know what is right and wrong. We also know that we stand in the shadow of the Capitol, and we know that we have seven short years until we, too, have the right to vote. So I am here today to honor the words of Toni Morrison. If there, is a, if there is a book that you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, you must be the one to write it. I urge everyone here and everyone who hears my voice to join me in telling the stories that aren't told. To honor the girls, the women of color who were murdered at disproportionate rates in this nation. each of you to help me write the narrative for this world and understand so that these girls and women are never forgotten. Thank you. Just for emphasis, that was an 11-year-old addressing not only this crowd, but the... Look. It's really hard to get your driver's license, adopt a pet, or get a credit card. But if you're 18 and you want to go out and buy an AR-15 in too many states, that's no problem. Go to a gun show in about 32 states, and you can have one in about one hour. We can't even buy a beer until we're 21. That makes no sense. These semi-automatic weapons were designed for war, not to hunt or shoot clays. They aren't cool toys. They're designed to kill people. 11 mass shootings were committed by men 21 and under. Many used handguns with huge rounds of ammo, and two used an AR-15. By raising the buying age to 21, we might have saved those lives. Enough is enough. It is time for a change. Never again. I'm Maya, and I'm 16 years old, and I'm in a creative writing program through After School Matters in Chicago. I just want to take this time and personally thank all of you for coming out here and letting me share this amazing opportunity with you guys. Thank you so much. I'm here because I have been personally affected by the lack of gun control. And I believe guns have taken over the minds of individuals who want an easy way out of their dilemma. Chicago goes through this every day, and you don't realize how much of a toll it is taking on our city until you see it in our communities. You see it on someone you know. You see it on someone like me. Freshman year in high school, I wanted to get some things for the store for my mom because she was sick. I remember pulling on all these clothes and going out in 10 or so degree weather. It was so cold. Get to the store grabbing all this stuff, thinking maybe she needs this, maybe she needs that, and finally getting into line. This guy in front of me all of a sudden gets upset because he didn't have enough money to pay for the things that he wanted to buy. He gets out of line and starts trashing the store, throwing everything over the floor, pushing carts, just, just making a fool out of himself. So finally, when I check out, I walk to the door and I'm ready to go when I hear a scream and a bang. I turn around and see he's grabbing all this stuff, pushing it into every crevice of his body, trying to grab as much as he can when he finally turns to me. He comes towards me and I couldn't move, I couldn't breathe, I couldn't talk, I couldn't think. All I remember is seeing dark jeans coming towards me. He pulls out this silver pistol and points it in my face and said these words that to this day haunt me and give me nightmares. He said, if you said anything, I will find you. And yet I'm still saying something today. Yeah. 
Guns have long scared our children, corrupted our adults, and publicly silenced our government. Guns have become the voice of America, and the government is becoming more negligent by this predicament by the day. Join me in sharing my pain and my anger. Help us by screaming to the government that we are tired of crying for help to a group of people that have turned their backs on us, despite their reassurance of making our country safer. Help us by screaming as loud as you can that we're tired of being forced under the rug. We're tired of seeing the faces of victims exposed on screens who were stolen from us too fast to even understand what and why it happened. Help us by sharing our stories to those who turned a blind eye and became deaf to our pleas for control. Help us by honoring those who will never have a chance to contribute the turn of our nation. Help us by vociferating the voices of those who are too oppressed to even speak for themselves. <laughs> Together, we can make sure that what happened to me, the students in Parkland, and to the individuals who stand here now does not repeat itself to other people. We deserve safer schools, safer classrooms, safer streets, and a safer place for us to learn and survive. We deserve better because I believe that we are the future. And we must act on putting this civil inflicted war while we still can. The new generation depends on our actions and we must deliver them effectively and as one. We are the turn of this century. We are the voice for change. We are the pieces to fix what America is falling short on. Make it happen. This song is dedicated to Stephon Clark, to Cynthia Clements, and all the unarmed black men and women killed by police weapons. Until all of us are free, none of us will be free. Telling my mama, you ain't gotta work no more. Same for my father, born in Ghana, down on that dirt road floor. Far as he came, I can't complain. Pain is so subjective. Spend so much time counting issues. I forget to count my blessings. Watch my cousins back at home, getting water out of well. While I watch my brother stacking stone, whipping water by the scale, trying to get a meal. On the other side, they ain't got a meal. We don't recognize we in heaven, so we think it's hell. It's been getting kind of hard for me to tell. Sometimes I wake up and I look up in the sky, asking why I'm alive when so many brothers die. But my pride won't let me give up, Lord, as hard as I try. In those times, I try to remember that we could be free. Yeah. If we only knew we were slaves to the pains of each other One thing I believe If I could learn to see my enemy as my brother We could be free, truly And love could wash away our sorrow I 
I don't want to wait for the afterlife. I don't want a vigil by candlelight. I don't want to be the new sacrifice. I don't want to turn into a poltergeist. Be a ghost at night full of broken dreams. Mama crying at an open casket, cold as ice. Suit three pieces, all dressed up for Sunday masses. Pastor say, put faith in God, but faith alone can't make things right. Politicians sent thoughts and prayers, but thoughts and prayers can't save our lives. Parkland, the Baton Rouge, police shooting shootings in the schools. Why, 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 why? I feel like Jaden kiss every time I watch the news. What the fuck I got to lose? So I'm down to bleed if it means things improve. Fools saying all lives matter, but these kids' lives they refuse to include. Locked from the polls, locked in a hood where the cops keep moving and blood keeps flowing and Congress keeps on doing nothing. Sometimes I wake up and I look up in the sky Asking why I survived all the days that I could have died Who am I in my place to contemplate suicide? In those times I try to remember We could be free, truly If we knew we were slaves to the pains of each other One thing I believe, if I could learn To see my kids my brother we could be free we could be free and love who wash away all the sorrow i'm not afraid to play i'm not afraid, I'm not afraid to, to bleed if it makes a better today not tomorrow Thank you. My name is Big Minson. Y'all kill me. Good afternoon. I'm joined by Brenna Levitan, Michael Solomon, and Nate Tinbite, founding members of MoCo for Gun Control. My name is Matt Post. I'm a 12th grader and the student member of the board for Montgomery County, Maryland. You and I gather in a time of moral crisis for our country. We stand at a moment when our nation's laws are not guided by what is right or wrong, not by what is morally sound for the many, but instead is limited by the insatiable greed of a few. In their greed, in their greed the gun lobby and their politicians have tried to deflect and distract us. They've tried to twist what is so clearly a gun issue into anything else. But we won't fall for it. We know that to only focus on school safety instead of American safety is to dismiss the thousands of tragedies in between the massacres. It ignores the people, disproportionately people of color, who die by bullet without even making a headline. Yet our politicians still lack the compassion to act. And when that cold inaction that continues to fuel this endless bloodshed churns and churns, it's not difficult to diagnose the moral health problem of this country. Our nation's politics are sick with soullessness, but make no mistake, we are the cure. Where they choose incrementalism, we choose real change. Where they embrace an extremism of complacency, we embrace an extremism of love. Where they believe in the absolutism of an amendment, we believe in the absolutism of human life. It won't be easy to change things. The immoral, the obstructionist, and the complicit are already lining up to block our path. We're gonna have to have some courage to fix this. 
It's going to take some will. So let me ask, is there a will to keep weapons of war off our streets? Is there a will to break the stranglehold of the NRA? Is there a will to bring morality to this country's politics? Then stand up, speak up, register to vote. If we sustain our efforts, if we keep our heads unbowed, who can stop us? If we march today, canvas tomorrow, and vote 227 days from now, we will make this a turning point for our country. And we, the new diverse, inclusive, and compassionate face of America, will lead this country once again down the path of righteousness. Thank you. In the days following the shooting, Many students expressed their frustration about one group, the NRA. Dana Lesh is the national spokesperson for the NRA. She is here with us. They use their media to assassinate real news. The left has their rigid, radical, anti-gun agenda. I'm so sick of these elitists looking down on gun owners as if we're just a bunch of rednecks who don't deserve the right to protect and defend ourselves. They use their schools to teach children that their president is another Hitler. Hitler took the guns. Stalin took the guns. If you try to take our firearms, doesn't matter how many lemmings you get out there on the street begging for them to have their guns taken. We will not relinquish them. They use their movie stars and singers and comedy shows and award shows to repeat their narrative over and over again. What matters is who the enemy is. They're the no-gun people, period. Listen up. You might have met our fresh-faced flower child president and his weak-kneed Ivy League friends. Hey, you Obama, you might want to suck at one of these, you punk! The only truly free people who have ever walked this earth have been armed people. They use their ex-president to endorse the resistance, all to make them march, make them protest, make them scream racism and sexism and xenophobia and homophobia, to smash windows, burn cars, shut down interstates and airports, bully and terrorize the law abiding. We see what it's like to be French, German, or Belgian, where innocent people cower in fear as evil closes in, doomed to defend their families with rolling pins and broom handles. The only way we stop this, the only way we save our country and our freedom is to fight this violence of lies with the clenched fist of truth. From my cold, dead hands. understand one thing. It won't be a day hands who end up cold. And it won't be day hands who end up dead. It's ours. <laughs> the young people of this country. Hello, everyone. My name is Christopher Underwood, and I'm 11 years old and a sixth grader at Eagle Academy at Ocean Hill, Brooklyn, New York. Also a junior ambassador for Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. Yeah. On June 27, 2012, my 14-year-old brother, Akio Christopher, was shot while walking home from a high school graduation party at his friend's house. My brother survived for 14 days and died on his 15th birthday, July 10, 2012. At that time, I was only five years old. Since this gun violence took away my childhood and nothing in my life was ever the same because of no, I no longer had my best friend. Losing my brother gave me the courage to be a voice for my generation. I turned my pain and anger and turned it into action and started speaking out for Akil, especially for the siblings who have lost their brothers and sisters, and for other children whose voices aren't heard, but feel the painful effects of gun violence. I have watched for years as gun violence continues to take a toll on communities across the country. 
For me, I would like to not worry about dying and focus on math and science and playing basketball with my friends. Don't I deserve to go up? On April 4th, we will remember Martin Luther King Jr. on his 50th anniversary of his death. What we sometimes forget is that he himself was a victim of gun violence. I would like to finish my speech today by honoring Martin Luther King Jr. by remembering his words, which are all as true today as when he was alive. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter, and our lives matter. Thank you. My name is Jacqueline Corin, and I am proud to say that Parkland is my home. <laughs> Parkland is the heart of this movement. But just as a heart needs blood to pump, my hometown needs the alliance of other communities to properly spread this message. We openly recognize that we are privileged individuals that, and would not have received as much attention if we weren't for the affluence of our city. Because of that, however, we share the stage today and forever with those who have always stared down the barrel of a gun. This issue is undoubtedly an epidemic that affects communities of all classes, an epidemic that the Center for Disease Control does not have the funds to research. This disease continues to spread, even though we have discovered the cure, but our government, our government officials close their ears because it involves change, a change that does not align with their own agenda. That is why Parkland cannot and will not do this alone. There is strength in numbers, and we need each and every one of you to keep screaming at your own congressmen. Don't be scared just because they have senator in front of their name. Our elected officials have seen American after American drop from a bullet. And instead of waking up to protect us, they have been hitting the snooze button. But we're here to shake them awake. Each congressman has a local office in their district, so pay them a visit or organize a town hall. They'll be home for the next two weeks for congressional recess. because we all know they'll show up then. We cannot keep America great if we cannot keep America safe. And 96 deaths by firearm every day is not what I would call great. Our First Amendment right is our weapon of war in this, a weapon that should be on our streets, a weapon that cannot kill, but can heal. Love will always outweigh the hate, as the universe is on the side of justice. So I need each and every one of you, no matter your age, to continue to fight alongside us, because hearts cannot pump without blood, and I don't want your community to join the ghastly inner circle that mine is now a part of. In the end, we are all fighting for our lives, but we are a great generation, and we'll be the ones to make America safe. Thank you. Um, I actually have a special guest for you guys, so I'm gonna come bring her up.
of Martin Luther King and Karen Scott King. <laughs> My grandfather had a dream that his four little children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream that enough is enough. Step I'm taking and every move I make feels lost with no direction. My faith is shaking, but I I gotta keep trying. I gotta keep my head high. Cause there's only gonna be another mountain. Oh, we gonna
lucky to be in the presence of all of you wonderful people fighting for what is right. Love you all so much. Thank you. Since 2007, often the weapon of choice for mass shooters is the AR-15 and similar variants. In 2012, one was used to kill 12 people in a movie theater in Colorado, and 20 elementary school children and six teachers. In 2015, one took 14 lives in California. In 2017, one contributed to the deaths of 58 concert goers in Las Vegas and 26 church goers in Texas. And last month, 14 students and three teachers in Florida. None of these deaths should have happened. From 1994 until 2004, we banned assault weapons like the AR-15. During that decade, there were 12 gun massacres with 89 deaths. In the 10 years after our leaders in Washington failed to extend it, the numbers climbed to 34 mass shootings with 302 lives lost. Assault weapons are an assault on our futures. Nearly 70% of the country supports another ban. Let's get AR-15s and all assault weapons off the street. Enough is enough. It's time for a change. Never again. I'd like to take it down for a minute here. There might, be, there might be musicians on this stage, but this is not Coachella. We might have movie stars in the crowd. We might have videos on these screens, but this is not the Oscars. And I don't know if you've been looking, but I don't see any Macy's Day balloons out there. This is real life. This is reality. This is what's happening in our country and around the world today. I'd like to make it real for a minute. February 14th is my sister's birthday. She had to spend that birthday huddled under a desk holding Lauren Hogg, David's sister, her hand, hoping that she was going to make it home that day. She was premature. She didn't know if she was going to make it at the beginning of her life and she didn't know she was going to make it home that day this year. She might have not stared down the shooter's eyes. She might have not even seen him or even known who he was. But he affected her life just as much as everybody else who's spoken on this stage today. And I know a lot of people, a lot of people are out there saying that we, we need to make America safe again. And I know that we can't. We cannot make America safe again until we arm our teachers. We need to arm our teachers. We need to arm them with pencils, pens, paper, and the money they need. They need that money to support their families and to support themselves before they can support the futures in those classrooms, to support the future that sits down at that desk waiting to learn. And we need to arm our students too. We need to arm them with the facts and the knowledge and the education they need to live in the real world, not just some fantasy, not just something painted out there by the public, by the media. We need them to be armed. And there's only one way to do that. This right here, this right here, this connects you to the whole of human information, the whole of human knowledge. It connects you with the click of a button. You can learn anything that I've learned, anything that we've all learned in our journey to this stage right here today. You can learn it just like that. Just go to a website, type it in, and it's there. 
I've been amazed by what I've seen. I'm amazed that I cannot see the end of this crowd here in D.C. today. I've been amazed by all of the walkouts that have been taking place over the past five weeks. And these walkouts have been criticized. They've been told that it is a disruption to the educational process. And I say to them, the real disruption to the educational process is staring down the barrel of a gun. It's the fact that you can be taking a calculus exam, and then when you're doing that, you have in the back of your head the thought that where's the shooter gonna enter? When's he gonna come in? Where can I hide? We're done hiding. We're done being afraid. We're done being full of fear because it is a waste of our time and it is not living out what our forefathers, what our founding fathers envisioned for this country. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And now I know we march today, but this isn't over. This is the beginning of the end, and from here, we fight. It is time to fight for our lives. And I say there is only one way to do that. We need to rev up society. We need to rev up the engines. We need to rev up America. And we do that through registering to vote. We need to do that through every single walkout. We will be making sure that you can register to vote, pre-register to vote. Then we will educate. We will be going around the country until these elections and therefore after, until we can tell every man, woman, and child in this country what is real, what is going on. And we need to make sure that everyone knows what is actually happening in their backyard and, in, and abroad. So we will register, we will educate, and then when it comes down to it, we will vote. They, they might preach NRA, they might preach GUN, but we're preaching REV. Register, educate, vote. Thank you, and hello, Uncle Myron. Eastman and I am a Parkland survivor. I was in room 1214 studying Holocaust history when bullets started flying in and I was the third classroom. Um, today one of my follow, fellow fallen ego, e eagles named Nicholas Doret, it would have been his 18th birthday today and I dedicate my march to him. I'm not only here to speak about school shootings, I'm here to speak for the urban communities have, that have been speaking out about this way before February 14, 2018. Their voices are just as important as ours, and they need to be heard. This is a very important subject, and it's, it's, it needs to change. Although it's been 38 days since the Parkland shooting, nothing has changed, and we need change now. This, will, this cannot happen again, and it's going to continue to happen again until we get change. How many more do we need? How many more do we need in schools? How many more do we need in the streets? We need change now, not only in schools, but in urban communities as well. All of our lives are important, and all of our stories need to be heard. No matter what color you are, what school you go to, what neighborhood you live in. 15 years ago, I lost my Uncle Patrick to gun violence in Brooklyn, New York. My mother almost lost her daughter to the same gun violence in Parkland, Florida. This needs to change. We've been fighting for this way too long and nothing has changed. And we need change now. Yes, I am a Parkland survivor and an MSD student. But before this, I was a regular black girl. And after this, I am still black and I am still regular. And I will fight for all of us.
Hello, beautiful people of America. It is a great day to be here. It is a great day to see all of you here, and I am proud of each and every one of you. And the truth is, I am not here for me. I am here for you. So you don't ever have to fear of getting shot in your own classroom. You don't ever have to wonder if you have to see your best friend die next to you. You don't ever have to worry about going into a Holocaust history class to learn about death and then experience it right before your eyes. And this why, this is why, oh my God. <laughs> and this is why this piece is called Enough. Never did I think I would be herded like cattle by a shower of bullets that let me scarred and rattled, forced to huddle among those who lost their last living breaths on a day that was designated for loves and laughs. I never got to say goodbye. I could barely see out my eyes because I was crying tears and blood at the same time. Barricaded behind those filing cabinets and bookcases that day taught me one thing and one thing only. Regardless of how much money you pay or how much you pray, if you don't change anything today, your children will no longer stay. So when do we say enough is enough? <laughs> day in and day out, our kids are getting shot up. And the moment we speak up, we're scolded that we are not old enough. It is as, it, it is as if we need permission to ask our friends not to die. Lawmakers and politicians will scream guns are not the issue, but can't look me in the eye. and it feels great! <laughs> We're not asking for a ban, we are asking for compromise. Forget your sides and colors, let's save one another. Use efficient regulation that doesn't make any exception. Close the cracks and loopholes with thorough background checks and psychological evaluation. Protect our schools like we do our other government establishments. Use security protocol and methods that are efficient. And one more request, listen. Our mission is simple and our ambitions are unbeatable. Let's keep the guns out of the hands of the wrong people and keep them in the hands of the safe and reasonable. So either, either you can join us or be on the side of history who pr prioritize their guns over the lives of others. The only way we can do this in, is in numbers. Let, let's have our lawmakers reflect our views and address our struggles. Let's stand, unite with one another. We the people still stand true, so now America, you will have to choose. Will you give up or is enough enough? And I have one more request. Today is March 24th, March for our lives, but it is also the birthday of Nick Duart, someone that I was senselessly murdered in front of me. Today is his birthday. I would like to sing together, happy birthday. One, One two, three. Happy birthday to you.
I served in the U.S. Army. I served in the Navy. Air Force. Marine Corps. Oorah. I was a 31 Bravo military police officer. Security Forces. 82nd Airborne. Radio Operator. SEAL Team One. I was stationed at Camp Anaconda in Iraq. In Afghanistan. Vietnam. My service weapon was an M4 assault rifle. My service weapon was an M16. It's basically the same. You know what? It is the same as the AR-15. Same weapon that's killed hundreds of people in the deadliest mass shootings in America. I know the power of this weapon firsthand. 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 And there is no reason. No reason. No reason why anyone other than military and law enforcement should have an assault weapon like this. I fought for this country. I believe in the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms. But that was created 200 years ago. Guns have changed a lot since then. High-powered, rapid-fire assault rifles like the AR-15 are meant for one thing. One thing. One thing. That's not something I want in my country. My name is Corporal Aiken. My name is Specialist LaHaye. Petty Officer, Second Class Day. Corporal Williams. Sergeant Yen. Airman Batesel. Staff Sergeant Houseman. Corporal Henderson. Staff Sergeant Sayson. Corporal De Jesus. Specialist Delta. Captain Vernier. Senior Airman Rice. Specialist Parker. Petty Officer Williams. My name is Sergeant Bell, and I support the ban on military-style assault rifles and safer gun laws in this country.
Um, uh, good afternoon, family. Yes, I said family. I said family because we are here joined together in unity fighting for the same goals. I say family because of all the pain that I see in the crowd. And that pain is another reason why we are here. Our pain makes us family. Us hurting together brings us closer together to fight for something better. Uh, my name is Alex King. I'm 17. I am a senior at North Lundell College Prep. Uh, as well as a peace warrior and a leader with Good Kids Mad City. Chicago has been at the forefront of gun violence for a very long time. With 650 people being murdered in the year of 2017 and 771 being murdered in the year of 2016. But that's not it. Gun violence travels in places like Florida, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles. It happens nationwide. I know many, I know many people who have lost loved ones, friends and family on a regular basis due to gun violence. My nephew, Deshaun Moore, he was taken away on May 28th in the year of 2017, two weeks after his 16th birthday. The day I lost my nephew was a huge turning point in my life. I started doing a lot of bad things, hanging around a bad crowd. I started to really give up. But there's this principle by Dr. King, and it states, the beloved community is the framework for the future. And what that means is, how our community is now is how it will be affected in the future if we don't make a change. If we aren't acting like a family now, we won't act like a family in the future. If pain is in our community now, pain will forever be in our community in the future if we don't make a change. Our community has been affected by gun violence for so long and will continue to be affected by it if we don't do something. But through my friends and colleagues, I found help to come up out of a dark place. Everyone doesn't have the same resources and support system as I was lucky to have. Myself and a few other Peace Warriors were able to take a trip to visit Parkland students and share our trauma with one another. We left not only knowing that we would support one another, but also realizing that without the proper grassroots resources, this issue of violence will not be solved and we will not stop until we are properly resourced in our communities. So family, let's continue to fight for what's right. And since we are a family now, I would like to pass on one of the traditions that me and my family does at North Lundell College Prep. So as I do this, I will ask that you follow me after I say repeat after me. So it's this, this African clap that we do at North Lundell that shows unity, which is unity is strength. Look at the numbers here in the crowd today. Do you see this? So, here's how it go. First, I would say one, and that's just a simple clap. So when I say one, it's like this. One, 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 one. Okay. Now, next, I would say four, and how that works is two sets of two. So when I say four, it goes like this. Four, one, two, one, two. Four, one, two, one, two. Four, one, two, one, two. And now, here's the tricky part. <laughs> um, now we're going to do 10, which is two sets of three and two sets of two. So how this goes is when I say 10, it goes like this. 10, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. 10, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. Now y'all think we could do this as a family? Yeah. All right, that's what I like to hear. Let's go. One, one. One, one, four, four, ten, ten. 
I love y'all. One, 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 four, four, ten. For we are survivors. Let, let me say that again for you. For we are survivors. We are survivors of a cruel and silent nation. A nation where freedom, justice, equality, and purpose is not upheld. A nation where we do not live out the true meanings of our creed. When will we as a nation understand that nonviolence is the way of life for a courageous people? When, we, when will we as a nation understand that we are not here to fight against one another, but we are here to fight for life and peace? <laughs> Dr. King once said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Which now leads me to say that violence cannot drive out violence. Only peace can do that. Poverty cannot drive out poverty. Only resources can do that. Death cannot drive out death. Only proactive life can do that. As I stand before you, I stand as D'Angelo McDade, an 18-year-old from the west sides of Chicago. I, too, am a victim, a survivor, and a victor of gun violence. I come from a place where minorities are controlled by both violence and poverty, leading us to be deterred by success. But today, we say, no more. I stand before you, representing the body of those who have experienced and lost their lives due to gun violence. For we are survivors, for I am a survivor. For we are survivors not only of gun violence, but of silence. For we are survivors of the erratic productions of poverty. But not only that, we are the survivors of unjust policies and practices upheld by our Senate. We are survivors of lack of resources within our schools. We are survivors of social, emotional, and physical harm. Dr. King had a dream. A dream that we as youth must now make our reality. Ephesians 4, 2, and 3 says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patience bearing with love. Make every count. Keep its unity of the Spirit through peace and love. For 1 Peter says in chapter 4, verse 8, Above all, you ain't hearing me. It says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers all wrongdoing. And for us, we, let me hear you say we. we. Let me hear you say we. we. As youth must now be the change that we see. My mother has this phrase that she used all the time, and she told me before I left home to come deal with this. She says, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything, and I stand for peace.
My name is Matthew Soto. And at the age of 15, I sat in my high school Spanish class while my sister Victoria Soto was being slaughtered in her first grade classroom in Newtown, Connecticut. On December 14th, Vicki went into school to make gingerbread houses with her first grade students before their holiday break. How many of you can remember doing that? The anticipation of having to wait all week to have to be on your best behavior, but that was cut short. They didn't get to make gingerbread houses because gunfire rang out in the hallway. Too many times has gunfire been ringing out in the hallways of schools across this country. Too many schools too many churches, too many movie theaters, too many neighborhoods, too many homes. Enough is enough. We do not have to wait for others to, others to make us safe. We need to do it ourselves. America, I am pleading with you to realize this is not okay. We do not have to live like this. To my fellow students, it is our time to stand up. Register to vote, bring power to the polls, and show those that say that our lives are not more important than a gun, that we are important, that we matter. Get involved in your community, because change, no matter how small, is change. Many of the students that were in fourth grade when my sister was murdered are now freshmen in high school. Five years ago this happened. Five years ago and no change has come. Today, over 400 students, teachers, and parents of Newtown families are here marching with us today. Today, we are presenting a banner to the Parkland community from the Newtown community. We know your pain, we know what you are going through, and we are inspired by your fight for change. We need to use our voices because we cannot change the past, but we can only fight to change and build a better future. My name is Tommy Murray. I'm a junior at Newtown High School. I live in Sandy Hook, and I attended the Sandy Hook Elementary School when I was in first grade to fourth grade. I was in sixth grade on lockdown for hours and hours when my neighbor shot his mother in her, in her bed, then gunned down 20 children and six of our educators, including my principal, Don Hawksprung. It was one of the worst days of my life. Since then, I have attended vigils. I have protested in front of the, the gun lobby in our town. I have sent letters to Congress. I traveled to DC to meet with Congress to beg them to do something to stop gun violence, but they did nothing. They didn't ban assault weapons or pass universal background check bills. And now the entire Parkland community is shattered the way our town was after the massacre in my elementary school. We are here to support the Stoneman Douglas students. We want to tell you to keep fighting as hard as you can. Your voices are so important. Your stories have truly changed the hearts and minds, and together, our stories will create the change that we need. If these mass shootings can happen in Newtown and Parkland, then they can happen anywhere. Connecticut passed strong gun laws after Sandy Hook, and Congress should do the same. Let's stand together to demand change. We will march with you. We will walk out with you. We will vote with you. We will end gun violence in our country, and we will honor with action. My name is Jackson Middleman, and I'm also a junior at Newtown High School. Tommy and I lead a gun violence prevention group that has been rallying since we were 11 years old to end gun violence in America. I was also on lockdown for five hours on 12-14-12.
the worst day of my life. The Sandy Hook mass shooting should have been the last one in our nation, but there are more and more every single day. And that's why Newtown says enough, and we say never again. We have worked incredibly hard for the last five years to protect other communities, but apparently Sandy Hook was not enough for America to make the changes. But after Parkland, we feel hope. You have inspired millions of students and adults all around the world. We want to thank the Parkland students, and we want to let them know that Newtown High School students stand with them. Long after the media trucks leave, we will stand by you during your healing and recovery. We are forever connected by a tragedy that could have been prevented if our lawmakers had the courage to enact smart gun legislation. It touched our hearts when Columbine High School sent us a banner with their message of love and hope, and we hope our message from Newtown High School will help you through your darkest days. And before we finish, I have a message. Mr. Trump, Congress, the Senate, and all elected leaders of America, you have failed us, and we have had enough of your NRA agenda. I'm calling out those who have taken money from the NRA. You better bring that check to the bank and put it in your retirement fund, because we're gonna vote you out. And now I'd like to introduce a new town in Parkland, Demand for Change. Newtown wants change. Parkland wants change. The world wants change. Give it to us now. My journey as an activist began just like many of you here. I witnessed injustice and violence in my community, and I spoke out. Today, you march because you too are witnesses to Stoneman Douglas, to Sandy Hook, to Virginia Tech, and to Columbine. To every friend, parent, sister, or brother who lost a loved one, my heart is with you. And though I can't be there with you today, I stand with you. I already talked to some of the students who organized this march today. Now, I want to talk to the rest of you, to everyone listening today. I hope that you will ask these student leaders how you can help them. They need other students, teachers, parents, and leaders to work together to end gun violence in schools. Whatever your politics, I know that no one wants another child to witness what these children have seen. Thank you. survivors from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, and we also wrote the song Shine. This song is not only ded dedicated to the 17 and 14 injured, the 17 victims that we lost, it's dedicated to all their friends and family, and to anyone who's ever experienced gun violence. Together, we are going to be the change. We are going to change the world. Thank you. city away you tore down the walls and opened up all the gates you you ruined this town you burned all of the bridges and you slowly let us drown But you're not gonna knock us down We'll get back up again You may have hurt us But I promise we'll be stronger And we're not gonna let you in We're putting up a fight You may have brought the dark But together we will shine the light And whoa, we will be something special Whoa, we're gonna shine Stand tall. 
gonna raise up our voices so we'll never ever fall. We're done with all your little games. We're tired of hearing that we're too young to ever make a change. Cause you're not gonna knock us down We'll get back up again You may have hurt us but I promise we'll be stronger and We're not gonna let you in We're putting up a fight You may have brought the dark but together we will shine a light and whoa not listen. We deserve to feel safe in our own schools. The time for change is now. The smallest of words can make the biggest difference. Be the voice for those who don't have one. Together, we have the power to change the world around us. You're not gonna knock us down. We'll get back up again. But I promise we'll be stronger and We're not gonna let you in We're putting up a fight You may have brought the dark But together we will shine a light You're not gonna knock us down We'll get back up again You may have hurt us But I promise we'll be stronger and We're not gonna let you in We're putting up a fight You may have brought the dark But together we will shine a light To all the people who are telling us to shut up, be quiet, wait your turn, we call BS. There are about 31 million young people between the ages of 19 and 25. If we all register to vote at 18 and show up on election day, then we can make the change we call for today. Common sense measures work. Let's make background checks universal. Stop the pipeline of illegal guns to our streets. Raise the age of buying a gun and save lives. Let's make waiting periods real and stop the epidemic of nearly 22,000 suicides per year and ban assault weapons that have no place in civilian hands. We are in the march for our lives and we won't stop until we make this country safer. The adults had their chance. Now it's our turn. Enough is enough. It's time for a change. Never again. Six minutes and about 20 seconds. In a little over six minutes, 17 of our friends were taken from us, 15 were injured, and everyone, absolutely everyone, in the Douglas community was forever altered. Everyone who was there understands. Everyone who has been touched by the cold grip of gun violence understands. For us, long, tearful, chaotic hours in the scorching afternoon sun were spent not knowing. No one understood the extent of what had happened. No one could believe that there were bodies in that building waiting to be identified for over a day. 
No one knew that the people who were missing had stopped breathing long before any of us had even known that a code red had been called. No one could comprehend the devastating aftermath or how far this would reach or where this would go. For those who still can't comprehend because they refused to, I'll tell you where it went right into the ground, six feet deep. Six minutes and 20 seconds with an AR-15, and my friend Carmen would never complain to me about piano practice. Aaron Feist would never call Kira Miss Sunshine. Alex Schachter would never walk into school with his brother Ryan. Scott Beagle would never joke around with Cameron at camp. Helena Ramsey would never hang out after school with Max. Gina Montalto would never wave to her friend Liam at lunch. Joaquin Oliver would never play basketball with Sam or Dylan. Elena Petty would never. Carol Lugren would never. Chris Hickson would never. Luke Hoyer would never. Marquine Duque Aguiano would never. Peter Wang would never. Alyssa Alhadaf would never. Jamie Guttenberg would never. Meadow Pollock would never.
Since the time that I came out here, it has been six minutes and 20 seconds. The shooter has ceased shooting and will soon abandon his rifle, blend in with the students as they escape and walk free for an hour before arrest. Fight for your lives before it's someone else's job. Side with 
never thought you would be standing here today. But we all here for a reason. We all got a story, we all got a purpose, and we all want what? We want change.
to anything without the support of you guys. We all know what this is like, and it's up to us to stop it. So one last final plug, get out there and vote. Get out there, get registered, and if... We are united. We are called the United States of America for that reason. Together we are whole, together we are one. Look to your left, look to your right. Brothers and sisters is what I see. Together, we unite to make a whole. Congress, politicians, you are the parents. Hear your children cry. We want to come home. We want home, whole home. Make our home well. Make our home prosperous. Make our generation the generation that fights. Make the generation that is changed. We are the change. Look at us. Look at your children. Your children are the ones fighting for their rights because they're fighting for their life to survive. We are here today for the survival fact that no more, no bloodshed due to the fact of a metal machine made by a human, triggered by a human. Guns only serve one purpose, to take a life. They don't spare, they don't protect, they take lives. When you stare at a gun, you know it's your end. We are saying no more. We are here to say we are United States of America and we are one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. United America! We are united. La lucha sigue, y'all. Para la gente, for our people. La lucha sigue! We will not stop! We shall not stop! We are magical! Somos poderosos! We are, we are magic! We are power! La gente, la gente, bro. La gente. Let me see. As one last important note, I think it's important that we realize we are, just like we are all Americans, we are all susceptible to the same corruption and greed, regardless of who you are or where you come from. So what we have here, what is constantly being sowed, are the seeds of corruption. But it's our job, it's the democracy, to ensure that those seeds never sprout. But the only way you can do that is by getting out and voting. If not for me, for everybody else on this stage and every single American child out there, vote for us, vote for our future, and help us fight for our lives at marchforourlives.com. Just give the mic to. Hey, everyone. Thank you all for coming today. If you look around, you are surrounded by the people who will be making this country a better place and who will be making it easier to sleep at night, easier to wake up in the morning and go to school, and easier to be Americans. So to all of you who are assisting us in the fight for change, thank you. Thank you all. And the fight begins today, and it will not end until we get what we need. Thank you.
Today's program has continued. Please follow guidance on the Sign up for important safety, weather, traffic, and transit information. Weather, traffic, and transit information by texting March 24, 888 
today to acknowledge and represent the African-American girls whose stories don't make the front page of every national newspaper. I represent the African-American women who are victims of gun violence, who are simply statistics instead of vibrant, beautiful girls at full of potential. People have said that I am too young to have these thoughts on my own. People have said that I am a tool of some nameless adult. It's not true. Well, joining me right now among the crowd is NBC News Jacob Soberoff. Jacob, uh, these uh, young people are for real. They're not actors. They've got a lot of emotion and a lot of actually personality, I have to say. Off to you, Jacob. You take one step, two steps in either direction, Chris, and you literally are surrounded by young people that want to see a change, make a difference, see gun reform. These are two middle school students. They're sisters. They came from Raleigh, North Carolina. We're surrounded by students from GW, but uh, what's your name? Sarah. You have a sign here that looks like the president's face, and it says, Stop Gun Violence. How old are you? I'm 13. 13 years old. You're out here protesting gun violence uh, and the president. Why? Because... I want change. I don't want to live in a world where I'm in fear of going to school and getting shot. Is that something that, that you're scared of? Yeah. Why? Because it could happen to anybody. It could happen to literally anybody. And that scares me. I don't want my sister to be scared. I want everyone to be safe. What is it, what is it like to hear your sister talk like that? How old are you? I'm 12. You're 12 years old. You hear your sister talk so passionately. Um, yours says, March for Our Lives. Why did you come out today? Because... I think of all my friends and all Jacob Soberoff, I guess we lost him there. Joining me right now here uh, in Washington is NBC News' Tammy Leitner. Tammy. Hey, Chris. I am here with a brother and sister team who I just love. This is Daniel and Julia. I first met them uh, about a month ago. They both go to school in Parkland. You were there for the shooting. I met you on a bus to Tallahassee. Uh, you're both very active, very vocal. Uh, Daniel, tell me a little bit about what you thought of today. It was such an incredible experience. I loved just being there, seeing what everyone had to say about the issues. It, it was really inspiring. And, you know, seeing the new town people really, it really, really did hit hard. I mean, seeing them come out and say, we do support Parkland, we support you, we stand with you, and we want to help you through this process because we've been there. It was just very, very moving and, and just touching. I, I loved it. I loved every second. And Julia, older sister, um Half million people out here. A lot of them are out here because of you guys at Parkland. What's your reaction? 
Yeah, I mean, it's one thing to see the support online and see people tweet us or like our messages and stuff like that, but it's one thing to actually see the mass amounts of people from all across the country who care about this issue and are willing to get out and vote for us. The one message that I've heard from Parkland students over and over today is, this is not the end. Today is not the end. You're going to hear from us again and again. Um, where is this in your journey? I mean, this is just the start for us. I mean, I don't know when it's, it's never going to end. It's never going to end, ever. I mean, we are students that are passionate about what we believe in. We're passionate. We really do care about this. This is important. And, you know, it's not, it's not really, I mean, it wasn't really one of the main issues in my agenda for, I mean, a while. But, I mean, now it's the priority for students like me. We want to see change in our legis in in our bills, in the laws that are made. We don't want to see the same thing happen over and over and over again. And I think that something will happen if we continue to push hard enough. Thank you guys very much. Uh, appreciate it. And I have a feeling this is probably not the last time we will be hearing from you. Uh, Daniel and Julia, brother and sister from Parkland. Uh, Chris, back to you. Thanks so much, Tammy Leitner. Uh, let's go right now to NBC's Ali Vitale, who's in the second city, Chicago. Ali. That's right, Chris, you can't tell right now because they're packing things up behind me over here, but there were thousands of people in this park earlier for the march. Many of the kids that I talked to making the points that many of the children in Chicago in, uh, in Washington were making throughout the day on our air. They've had enough of this gun violence and they're out here speaking out to save their own lives. Many of them telling me that if they can't be safe in their schools, where can they feel safe? Now, the people that they're talking to are the lawmakers in Washington who have been dealing with this issue or not dealing with this issue over the course of the past several years. I actually caught up with one of them, Senator Dick Durbin here, as he was marching in Chicago. Take a look at what he had to say. Fix Nix, I supported. Sure. But let me tell you, 17 lives in Parkland, Florida, and the lives that we lose every every week uh, are worth much more than Fix Nix. And what's your message to these, these young kids who are out here marching? They're, our, they're teaching us. Uh, I'm not giving them a message, they're giving us a message. They learned in their civics class that a democracy depends on people who vote. That's what makes a difference. And so that's definitely what kids out here are trying to figure out. What will spur this kind of change? Now, the thing that likely will spur change is that many of them are getting ready to go to the polls. Even if they're not old enough, there were many out here who were urging their friends who are of age, get to the polls as soon as you can, vote for people who are going to put in the kind of gun legislation that we're hoping for. And there were folks out here capitalizing today, getting people registered to vote, telling people when's the next time they can vote for someone to put in office that will support these stricter gun control laws that many of the folks out here that I talked to today are really pushing for, Chris. Well, we'll see what it means in November. Ali Vitale, thanks so much for reporting from Chicago. Now live from West Hartford, Connecticut, Democratic Senator, United States Senator Richard Blumenthal. Senator, do you think, well, let me be blunt, will this matter today? It will matter, Chris. It will definitely matter today, not alone, but if these young people, as they seem determined to do, actually register vote and mobilize others to vote. There was an energy and passion today all around the state of Connecticut, as you can see from the excellent reporting you've done all around the country. I've been to three marches around our state, and there is a sense that this kind of audacity and authority has to be sustained when it comes to this November and then November of 2020. How do you uh, crosswalk a very successful demonstration, a protest today, a rally really, an exciting positive rally. How do you crosswalk that into the minds of the resistant U.S. senators? I'm going to take this picture of the overwhelming crowds here in Connecticut and around the country back with me to my colleagues. And I'm also going to take with me the images of young people registering to vote, uh, as active as they were in speeching, speechifying and talking today, they were also registering people to vote. And that's an image and a message that I think is going to be very powerful. And as my colleague Dick Durbin said, it's a lesson in democracy. This is what democracy looks like. This is what America looks like. And that's what my colleagues are going to have to absorb and understand something is different here 
Something is different this time. I've been doing this cause for 30 years, and I have never felt nearer to fundamental national reform because the country is saying enough is enough. You know, I, I can't say more than you just said, but being here, you feel that even more, the idea this is what democracy should look like. It's happy, it's positive, it's hopeful, and people are here and they want to get something done. But the gun lobby has a wonderful way of playing these situations. When they're confronted with public outrage, they fade, they don't talk, they don't go on television, they go back to where they hide, and they wait it out. And they come out three or four weeks later when the excitement has subsided, and they legislate against uh, gun control and gun safety. How do you smoke them out? How do you get them to come out and face the music that they should be facing today when you know they're all hiding? The president's in Mar-a-Lago today. He's president of the United States. A half million or a million people came here to protest. He skipped town. It seems to be a metaphor for the way the gun lobby operates. They get out of town when people are excited. They come back in town when the crowd's gone. They have a very sustained and systematic playbook. And they know the script, which depends on fear and money. They have built this movement based on single issue voters, that is, people who go to the polls and vote on one issue alone. The young people who are out there in the streets today, those powerfully eloquent speakers at the rallies that you have televised and the ones in Hartford and Enfield and all around the state of Connecticut are going to change this dynamic. And it may sound idealistic to say so, but they are not going to settle for the same old, same old. They want change, and they have the energy, as did the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the marriage equality movement, the women's health care movement, to make that change happen. I think that's fundamental, Chris, and it may, in fact, be the factor that smokes out the gun lobby, because my colleagues are going to see that playbook no longer works. Senator Richard uh, Blumenthal, Connecticut, one of the real heroes of this struggle. Thanks so much for joining. I'm joined right now by all kinds of people anyway. But let's go to Mariana Tencio, who's along the march route first before we go to the guests with me. Mariana. Chris, Mariana. I'm here with families as they're starting to head out after listening. I hope you can hear me, Chris. I'm here with families, young people, as they're starting to head out after listening to these very powerful speeches and speakers and just taking in this historic day. Some families here, they are joined by these school shootings, as is the case with many across the country. It's the case of the Britton family right here. Mom went to Parkland and she went to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas uh, and her children now move to Maryland and they are going to go to Great Mills uh, in Maryland as well. So again, Chris, just imagine families that are joined by these horrific events. I just want to ask you, Mom, what did it mean to be here today with your children? It meant everything. My kids are my everything. And I think that it's really important that they be a part of this movement. This movement is, is going to be big, and uh, I really need to them to understand the just the the impact that going against gun violence means to our family, to our community. Um, my sister went to the funerals. I still have family that live in Parkland today, right now. Um, I've got friends that know the victims from Marjorie Stoneman, I mean, from uh, Great Mills. So these are our communities and they mean everything to us. And Chris, her children, 12, 11 years old, they're gonna go to Great Mills. What goes through your mind when you're going to go to school now after what you've seen in Great Mills and in Parkland? Um, I'm a little scared as to what happens because when I sit when I, I sit in front of my class and through those doors, anybody can come in. And I want to be focused on my education and not that I could die in a matter of seconds due to gun violence. Just real quick, do you feel some hope after today? Um, yes, I do feel a little hope because the gun laws, I hope that this brought everybody together and it can change gun laws. Thank you so much. Yeah. Chris, as we just heard from these young people who are headed home today after this powerful day, they should be thinking about their education, getting good grades, and not about getting shot in school. That was the change and the message from this march today here in Washington. Chris?
Mariana Atencio, excellent reporting. Thank you so much. I'm joined right now by former talk show host and former Naval Intelligence Officer Montel Williams, former White House Press Secretary and MSNBC political analyst Josh Ernest, and former RNC Chair and MSNBC political analyst Michael Steele. Michael, I want to start with you because you and I have been close to politics a long time. Yep. Uh, my, I, have, I have four brothers, as you know, and one of them is a gun guy, mm -hmm. Second Amendment guy. He believes that not for hunting or anything like that, not for killing animals, right. doesn't do that. He just believes in the right to have guns to protect yourself if the government comes and tries to take them away. Right. He is a pure Second Amendment guy. Right. Those guys aren't going to change their mind because of a protest. No, they're not. So no. Who will change their mind? Well, it's, it's not about changing their minds on an individual basis. It's about what, what should be the nation's policy in dealing with what is a real problem right now. Having kids being killed in their classrooms, you know, having communities, uh, you know, torn asunder because of the kind of violence that we see in cities like Chicago. Uh, so it's, it's, it's trying to find that balance. I would suspect your brother is not going to uh, begrudge a mother who's just lost a child uh, to gun violence uh, from wanting to see something done to protect not just the, the rest of her children, but everyone else's child in that community, if that's what it takes. Now, what it takes, that's the question. That's where the debate needs to be. And you cannot have a, a one-sided debate. You cannot have a debate where it's shut down, as we've seen just recently in, in, by the White House, where they start down one road and then they back away from it. Yeah. If you're going to engage on the subject, the American people want you to engage because they want solutions. Montel, I can hear the fathers in Pennsylvania in what we call the center of Pennsylvania, the T. Nobody's going to tell me when my son gets a rifle. I'll decide when he gets a rifle. But here, that cultural father-son thing, I think, is working against people like Toomey or even Manchin and these guys to go any further than they're willing to go right now. You know, I, I think we're, we're missing a point. 77% of people like your brother and me, I own 15 guns. I have an AR-15. I have an SB-89. I have several guns. I spent 22 years in the military, and every year you tested me to make sure I could shoot them. So I like to shoot guns, but I don't shoot animals. I shoot rocks. I shoot cans. Right. That is none of my children shoot. And I'm going to tell you something. What you saw today is going to change the 77 percent of gun owners. I'm an NRA member. 77 percent of us believe that we need to have background checks. 64% of us have already changed our mind and said, yes, we need to take people who are on no-fly list and take guns from them. We are changing, but what's is really... Is the NRA a democracy? Oh, heck no, but what's... What, <laughs> what is... That's all I'm at. What is is this. Those people, those people right here, clear statement. Let me, I don't want to take too much time. In 1973, I was a student elected to the Board of Education in the state of Maryland. I was my class president. I was a president or the, the parliamentarian for the Chesapeake Regional Association of Student Councils. I was one of these kids. And look what they created. This mouth is now seen all over the yeah. world. I just spoke in Israel. I'm speaking in Mexico. So this group is going to change America. Don't think about, don't think about it. It might happen. It's happening. Josh? Look, I, the, what, what President Obama often in, engaged when he was talking immediately aftermath of some of these disasters was an accusation that somehow he was politicizing this tragedy. And what he came to say was actually, we do need to politicize this tragedy. It is our political system that is so broken and not being responsive to people who need common sense solutions, not rounding up guns and taking them away, but making sure that we've got background checks, uh, making sure that weapons of war aren't floating around our streets and easily obtained by people who are actually on a no-fly list. So these are common sense proposals. What we need is a sustained political movement to make some change. And that's actually what we're seeing on the streets today. That is what's okay, going right, let me Okay, let me tell you what you're up against. Brilliant silence. The president's in Mar-a-Lago. He went yes. there on purpose, seeing this crowd come here. That's right. He could have stayed here. That's right. He went out of town. The Congress is on a two-week, I didn't even know Easter's anywhere near time happening, but they're already in their Easter break for two weeks. They're hiding out of town. Yeah. So they're wait out. They're going to outweigh this crowd. They're going to wait them, outweigh them. And happen. people like Paul, happen. okay, how does Paul Ryan, the speaker, get pushed into bringing up a gun bill? When, when the he speaker sit, has voted out. Exactly. When he's voting out, minority. That's what. That's what. That Who's going to get happens. voted out? Okay, we're right. only going to see change in Congress when we see different right. people in okay, Congress. Okay, great, great, uh, Mantel. Thank you. Oh, thank Your you. Your optimism overwhelms me. Thank, thank you. <laughs> I believe in I, kids. I believe in it too, but I want it to happen. Uh, Mantel, thank you so much. Uh, still to come, right here on MSNBC. Much more from Washington D.C. Everybody's still here. The party, the powerful party of action's not over. I'm joined by now by former Congressman Donna Edwards. She's joining us right now, and also Congressman. Been Ryan Costello to talk about whether adults in Congress can follow the example of hundreds of thousands of young people here today. We're back live from Washington at the March for Our Lives after this.
captivating exteriors. Dynamic lighting. Elevated comfort. And one more thing. The 2019 Jeep Cherokee. Get 0% APR financing for 60 months, plus $1,000 bonus cash on 2018 Jeep Cherokee models. Pain relievers might all seem the same, but Salon Paz Pain Relief Patch is the first and only FDA-approved OTC topical inset and the strongest labeled pain reliever available without a prescription. Salon Paz for tough pain. In the modern world, it pays to switch things up. And when you switch to eSurance, you can save time, worry, hassle, and yep, money. In fact, drivers who switched from Geico to eSurance saved hundreds. That's auto and home insurance for the modern world. eSurance, an Allstate company. Click or call. Most people, I look like most people. But on the inside, I feel chronic, widespread pain. Fibromyalgia may be invisible to others, but my pain is real. Fibromyalgia is thought to be caused by overactive nerves. Lyrica is believed to calm these nerves. I'm glad my doctor prescribed Lyrica. For some, Lyrica delivers effective relief for moderate to even severe fibromyalgia pain and improves function. Lyrica may cause serious allergic reactions, suicidal thoughts, or actions. Tell your doctor right away if you have these, new or worse depression, unusual.
Thank <laughs> you.